for almost 125 years, this group called the Christian and Missionary Alliance has been in existence in the United States and many countries overseas. If we're going to look to the future with any kind of impact, we have to have something to stand on. And it's important to stand on the shoulders of the one who had the original vision. I think it's very healthy for us to take away some of the accoutrements that have gathered around Simpson for all these years and get back to a man who had a heart of passion, a heart of clarity, uh, a heart filled with Christ, and say, Lord, once again, give us that same vision for a new century. My mother told me that she gave him to the Lord to be a minister and a foreign missionary, if the Lord so willed. And he lived to grow up and was so inclined. Louisa Simpson, sister. I was a young, ambitious minister of 21, and had not yet learned the humbling lessons which God, in faithful love, is pleased to teach us as fast as we are willing to learn. In coming among you, I am not ashamed to own this as the aim of my ministry and to take these words as the motto and keynote of my future preaching, Jesus only. This is probably what drove him more than anything else, the, the whole truth and need of worldwide evangelization, uh, seeing mankind is lost without Jesus Christ. The focus of his life is to see people come to Christ, live in Christ, abide in Christ, live a victorious life in Christ. While he's sensing all of these burdens, he has an experience of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Something smote my heart. All you need is Jesus. You go to him. I went to my office in the church vestry, and I waited there on my face at his blessed feet until he came. And thank God, he enabled me in some measure to say, I have seen Jesus. Simpson comes to New York City and becomes the pastor of prestigious 13th Street Presbyterian Church. While he's there, he's not only pastoring the congregation of that church, he's also doing his own street evangelism down on the docks of New York City. And my idea of a church is one that is comprised of thousands of members of no particular class, but of the rich and poor, side by side. While Simpson is holding conventions at different parts of the country, one of the places he goes is Old Orchard, Maine. He returns there on a number of occasions and has great uh, encounters with God there, with great weakness in body. One day, Simpson, crying out to God, goes for a walk at Old Orchard, Maine. And not only does he sense healing for his body, but he, he learns through this whole experience with Christ that, that he can expect to take Christ as his strength as well. It had only been a few moments, but I knew that something was done. Every fiber of my soul was tingling with a sense of God's presence. Physically, I do not think I'm any more robust than ever. I'm intensely conscious that I am drawing my vitality from a supernatural source. I believe, and am sure, that it is nothing else than the life of Christ manifested in my mortal flesh. I know it is the Lord. So Jesus is not only healer, Jesus is also health. And uh, he comes back from Old Orchard, Maine, and that, that all feeds together into his doctrine of the fourfold gospel. This fullness of Jesus, as Simpson begins to express it and use terms such as deeper life, uh, fullness of the Holy Spirit, etc., are the doctrines that underlie the, the fervency of mission. Experiencing Christ in all his fullness and all this blessing, and out of that grows a missionary mandate. Uh, not that we have to take the message out, but we want to. We want others to have that same deep abiding presence of Christ for body, mind, and soul. I heard the sweet voice of God today several times, and I was filled with such intense desire to follow anywhere. Over a period of time, he leads around 100 Italian dock workers to Jesus Christ and invites them to church. And on a given Sunday, they, they uh, come to his upper middle-class Presbyterian church and because of their ethnicity and their and their class level in society they're turned away from the church by the elders of the church. Simpson's appalled. Our master never showed any prejudice or bias toward any person or class. He knew no color line save that of his blood red cross. Probably uh, his, his leaving would not have come that quickly had there not been the impetus of a bunch of people not being welcomed there. 
For two years, I spent a happy ministry with this noble people. Found after a thorough and honest trial, it would be difficult for them to adjust to the radical and aggressive measures to which God was leading me. What they wanted was a conventional parish for respectable Christians. What their young pastor wanted was a multitude of publicans and sinners. Simpson takes that as a vision from God to resign this prestigious pastor being paid in the 1880s $5,000 a year, a very prestigious and, and wonderful salary for a pastor, and breaks out on his own and founds what will later become the Gospel Tabernacle because he wants doors open to human beings. I remember well the cold and desolate afternoon years ago when a little band of humble praying Christians met to begin this work for God. We opened our Bibles. These words were just before us. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. We knelt before him there and thanked him that we were poor, that we were few, that we were weak, and threw ourselves upon the might of the Holy Ghost, and he has never failed us. After finding themselves in many different locations upon leaving 13th Street Presbyterian Church, Simpson and his little band of followers uh, end up on the corner of 8th Avenue and 44th Street in Manhattan. The buildings that they build there are built with ministry in mind. If we can look back to even the design of the, of the sanctuary that he builds, he builds it so no one's sitting very far from the preacher. He, he, he's into communicating the message of God. Built with that is also the bookstore and Alliance Publishing that, that sends out the gospel in printed fashion. Uh, that same bookstore is just around the corner today on 43rd Street, one of the largest Christian bookstores in America. He builds a, a hotel. Uh, in and out of that hotel or dormitory is where all the missionaries come and go from around the world because they're all going out by ship from New York City. No thought of a denomination as such where we're separate or better than other people, but a, a nerve center for a movement that's going to move the world. I trust the day will come when we shall count them by thousands in foreign lands. I believe the greatest purpose of God in sending us here, next to preparation for His coming, is to send the gospel everywhere. Quite often Simpson's sermons would make the New York Times. He was followed very, very often around the city by, by uh, different reporters that would, would try to catch him off guard or catch something new that he said. And uh, two stories particularly come to mind. One is that one that is reported when he was just getting ready to speak on divine healing. He, he must have had a sore throat or a scratchy throat and he pulls a cough drop out of his pocket and as he does, several fall out and roll across the wooden floor in front of him. And the sermon is not so much reported in the New York Times as the fact that the healer had cough drops in his pocket that day. Uh, Simpson takes it as just a, a funny incident and gets on with his ministry. Uh, another particularly uh, poignant uh, and powerful incident that is, is recorded by the secular press is when Simpson is preaching on the second coming of Jesus Christ, the imminent return of Jesus Christ. And after the sermon, the reporter says, Dr. Simpson, can you tell us when Jesus Christ will return? And he said, yes, if you will write it word for word, I will tell you exactly when Jesus Christ will return. And Simpson quotes to him then from Matthew, this gospel of the kingdom must first be preached to the ends of the earth, and then will the end come. And the man was under obligation to print that, and he indeed did. When we look at great people of history, the tendency is to put them on a pedestal and think maybe God doesn't work that way anymore. As you look at the life of A.B. Simpson, you find a, a cultured man, but yet a normal man, an average man on the street. As he walked down the street, there was nothing that distinguished him from anybody else in, in Manhattan of, of, of his level of society. And yet there was an anointing upon this man. When he was at home, he was still a doting father, a loving father. Letters that he would write from Europe to his wife would be, Dear Maggie, and he'd sign them, Love Bertie. And, and as he'd reference the children in these letters, he'd reference them by their nicknames or by their, their little uh, toy names that he'd use when he was home. He'd run his fingers through the kids' hair and mess up their hair, much to the chagrin of his daughters when he'd do that to them. Um, there, there's nothing about the man that, that you can say is abnormal or supernormal. 
He's, he's an average believer in Jesus Christ who catches a vision of the fullness of Christ in his life and the fullness of what Christ wants to do in and through any of us who will submit ourselves to him. An approachable, average believer in Jesus Christ, anointed by God.